I'm based between Dublin and Galway. I have my studio in Galway and uh, I find I travel a lot to Dublin. I end up working a lot in Dublin. Um, I work a lot with sculpture and installation. Um, I work with concrete and glass and ephemeral materials like uh, string and electrical wire. Um, this is an example of, of some of my work. Uh, I'm very much influenced by space, light and architecture. It's been a fascination for me for years. Um, I guess this fascination started, this is actually an image of the view from my hometown in Galway. It's a view of the sea uh, from the promenade. And it's this sense of vast uh, extending space in front of you that, that, um, that I started to miss when I moved to Dublin originally. Um, I found myself very frustrated living in a small, dark, noisy apartment and uh, I missed the space and light that I had at home by the sea on the west coast. I was working on a project at the time and uh, I started to look at these two opposites as a way of escape from this frustration. And this um, research uh, into the architecture that surrounded me actually became a, a passion of mine and I've been uh, hugely influenced by it since. This is some of the work I did for my degree show. It's laminated sheet glass, which is literally glued 19 mil glass. It's ground and polished and cast concrete. Uh, I work with three different techniques, uh, laminated glass, uh, cast, kiln cast glass, and sand cla cast glass. And then I also work with concrete. Um, I use a lot of very minimalist forms. Um, and all of these pieces uh, create the illusion of architectural space within the piece when the viewer looks into it. Um, and this, is, this image that the viewer sees is affected by the surface area, the amount of light that I allow into the piece, the color of the piece, and it, it all works together to create uh, an illusion of an architectural space and uh, to create a mood or an atmosphere within the piece. Um, they work with both natural light and artificial light and with the natural light as the, the light changes throughout the day the image that the viewer sees intensifies or changes as the daylight changes also. Um, and they're almost like small worlds when you look inside. They're quite difficult to photograph because as you move around the image moves with it. So these are just a few images. Um, this piece is actually in the National Museum at the moment in their um, What's in Store. It's part of their collection. And I see this work as a starting point. Unlike a building where uh, the structure is, is there and it's final, it's almost like a full stop, I see these as a starting point for the viewer's interpretation. So the viewer's imagination takes over and it becomes something beyond the piece that's there. Um, I see them as a suggestion of possible space. So these are, this is a piece called Tower, which is, um, it's a, a kill and fired um, float glass. So as I was working over the past few years, when I started to do my MA in visual arts practice in 2008, I had done my degree in the National College of Art and Design specialising in glass. Um, I found I had become very familiar with the processes. I had developed a very tight relationship with um, the materials I was using and I became quite precious about them. And I found that was restricting some of the work that I was making. And I also wanted to go large scale and the facilities I had were slightly limiting um, for that. Um, so I started to look at, at um, this is when I started to become fascinated with the architectural model or the drawing. Um, and I started to look at using other materials. Um, I'm fascinated the way architects on a drawing use perspective as a tool to communicate three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional uh, piece of paper. And it's this fascination that led on to the, the um, research that I've done over this past few months into different architects. Um, 
and I see the model or the drawing as a, a kind of like the, the, the way I describe the work, it's a starting point. Um, it's anything is possible and the viewer's imagination when they look at it takes over and in the viewer's imagination it can become anything it can be becoming a utopian world world it's not restricted by um, the pr practicalities of day-to-day -day living and um, the the final user um, it's not restricted by any of those different things um, so these are just some other pieces that I've made since then. And this divided space. I think what actually one of the pieces I've probably passed by already, this piece actually will be at the opening of the exhibition tonight. Um, and it's called White Picket. And it's, it's, um, it's made from the same mold. And uh, in the making process, through the grinding and polishing, every piece has uh, changed. And it was a reflection on what was happening at the time with these estates popping up all over the place and these multiple blocks um, being built. So the first architect that I was looking at was uh, Bruno, Bruno Tausch. He's a German architect. Um, he was around 1880 to 1838. And he's most famously known for his uh, glass pavilion at Cologne uh, Werbuck exhibition in 1914. And this is an example. And a lot of it is made from my favorite material, glass. So um, this is what first introduced me to Bruno Taub. But what I was particularly interested in was his, his work um, that he made after, oh, well, they were drawings, really, that he um, did after World War I when he discovered there wasn't as much um, commissions for architects at the time. And uh, he gathered together a group of architects to develop drawings and designs for utopian structures. And this was then published into a book called uh, Alpine Architecture. Um, all of these designs were made with the intention that they would never be more than a drawing. Um, they would never reach fruition. So and become a building, so they were almost left free, so they could be anything, so anything was possible. So a lot of these structure, structures that were designed were just not possible. Um, a lot of them were um, uh, mountaintop uh, cities, utopian cities, that were made of large crystalline structures um, that in real life could not be built. And I guess what fascinates me about these designs is the fact that they were intentionally done to, to develop the idea or the, 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 this imagined world that would not exist. It's almost like an intangible world. Um, and it's that aspect of, of this work that really um, excites me. Um, and these, these images are these cities, utopian cities, become alive in, in the, the viewer's imagination and they live on beyond that. So they suggest a possibility that probably in real life could never exist. So these are some of the designs. Um, the next architect that I looked at was uh, Tom de Poer. He's an Irish architect. And in particular, his, uh, his um, design for the Irish Pavilion for the Architectural Biennale in 2000 called N3. Um, Ireland had never been represented um, at the Biennale before, so um, they had no brief except to represent Ireland and they had a mere 10,000 euro to build the construction. And what they wanted to do was uh, actually make something. So they didn't want to just hang images or you know, uh, provide models. They actually wanted to construct something that would be tactile to the viewer and the viewer would have to engage with. Um, this is the actual uh, building here. Um, it's made of 21.12 tons of compressed peat in the form of 40,224 briquettes. These were donated by Borden Amona. It's shaped in the, in the shape of the letter N. And when you walk into the building, there are only two entrances, a south and north facing entrance, which is rectangular in shape, which meant the viewer couldn't just walk in. They actually had to turn sideways to get in. And you couldn't see inside the building. So it meant the viewer had to actually engage with 
the construction before they could actually find out. Um, and the letter N had particular meaning in it at the time. Uh, de Poer was working on a project um, na near St Nicholas, Nicholas of Amir Church, which is literally just down the road. Um, and the idea of the briquettes developed from that because it used to have um, a fuel um, area that was owned by St Nicholas's. And when he was uh, researching it, he discovered that there was also a, um, a church of San Nicolo de Lido in Venice also. So there was that link there where it was rumoured that the bones of St Nicholas was, was buried. Uh, and then the, letter, the number three uh, popped up a lot in um, the stories of St Nicholas um, in his uh, in, um, interventions. A lot of the, uh, in the stories, a lot of the, um, these incorporated the letter or the number three. Um, so I'll just go through some of this here. The idea for this was a play on the value of land. Um, this, uh, this material is actually a piece of Ireland. It's carved up from the Irish landscape. It's, um, and then it's taken home. It can be purchased quite cheaply in any store, and then it's burnt. And it was a play on the idea that in Venice, which is uh, a place where land is quite restricted, um, it was that play on the value of land and um, it was seen that this would be a gift to Venice. So at the end of this it would de be demolished and it would be turned to a mulch and then returned to the ground for the, the gardens of Venice. So it would become full cycle. Instead of being destroyed in the fires in Ireland it would, uh, it would um, be returned to the soil. And also uh, turf and peat has a huge um, huge history in, our, in the Irish psyche. Um, so I'll just go through some of these images. He also used some traditional techniques in, that were used in traditional architecture in Ireland, um, mainly corbelling, which was used in some of the beehives and the monasteries in Ireland. So there were a lot of um, different things that were um, subtle suggestions of the inspiration, but they weren't uh, completely obvious to the viewer. And the actual design of it, once the viewer got in through the gate, there was two uh, chambers inside, one of which had a bench. So the viewer could actually sit down with an open uh, roof where the viewer could, the viewer could um, sit down and contemplate um, their relationship with the space and also the relationship with Ireland. Um, so that's a view of, of that. This is some of the layout of the building, give you a better idea of the actual layout. Now, he was very particular not to be uh, to, to put too much information out for the viewer. So the only bit of information on the inspiration for this building were nine little cards that were placed on the bench <coughs> and that were in a, a rubber, there was a rubber, a yellow rubber cast briquette, it, almost like um, a gold nugget found in the bog. And all of these images had uh, images of Irish culture that had influenced him and images of um, of some of the inspiration that, that triggered these ideas. So the viewer could take these away and contemplate their own relationship with it. So it was very much an engagement with the viewer's imagination. And this is the aspect of it that really fascinates me. Um, it's this idea that uh, although the, this particular, rather than um, Bruno Taut's uh, work that never exist in physical form. This actually existed in physical form, but the viewer's imagination and this intangible idea of space was a strong influence. It was almost like the building blocks. So even after this building was destroyed, which it was torn down and eventually turned to mulch and returned to the gardens of Venice, it still lives on as a memory in those who discovered it. And even though I didn't 
see the piece or the building itself, it still lives on in my uh, imagination and my thoughts of it. So that's kind of a little bit about the inspiration that led to this. This is some of the work then that I was doing at the time. Um, I had come away from um, glass and concrete, working with quite ephemeral materials, to things that I wouldn't be as, as precious about, that would be quick and easy, well, I thought would be quick and easy to work with, although I've discovered since it's not so easy, but they would basically get, make, allow me to take a step back from the work and look at it in a new light. And at the time, I was fascinated with the architectural drawing and taking that idea of uh, two-dimensional space and three-dimensional space, taking a drawing and actually physically putting it in a three-dimensional space so the viewer could actually walk around. So this is a piece that was made for a group exhibition called Latent Connections with two other artists. Um, my piece is actually at the very back. It's electrical wire. Um, and it's a, a, a perspective, a, a drawing based on two-point perspective. Um, and this electrical wire, some of it is normal electrical wire. The rest is, uh, has a phosphorus coating that lights up when electricity goes through it. So what I was trying to do was defining this taking that two-dimensional drawing and defining it in a three-dimensional space. And actually taking the photograph of that again is almost flattened again, it's almost gone full cycle. So this is kind of some of the work that was going through my head. And then this is work that we are having a second exhibition in Amoka. The uh, opening will be tomorrow night at six o'clock. If anyone's around, please do come. It should be a good party. But um, this work was uh, the new work that I wanted to create. I wanted to create an installation. And I wanted to combine the two ideas of these concrete, these small little worlds that I was creating, the space inside, and also combine this idea of uh, drawing this three-dimensional space within the gallery space. So it combines, this piece actually combines this uh, line drawing made of, of um, twine and a sculptural piece. And it what I'm trying to do is, is um, draw the actual finished piece in some way in, in the actual space. So again, taking a photograph of it almost flattens it. So um, it's almost doing full cycle. So this is the actual piece, the concrete piece. And the drawing then is in the background. I think that's it. And I am going to pass you on to Mark Elliott. Well, it was not so easy to think of what to say here about this particular issue. Um, and I must say that that's partly... Uh, when when uh, Susanna and I discussed the nature of my presentation, in the first instance, I thought to talk about aesthetics. Because, as you no, aesthetics and perception are almost indivisible. But at one point in time, they would be synonymous. You want me to speak well, into the... Okay. Uh, at one point in time, they would be synonymous with one another. Um, and I thought, well, in actual fact, this is like taking coals to Newcastle. Maybe I'm talking to people who know much more about this than I do. And all I can do is provide a commentary on that. Um... And then I thought, then we discussed the nature of this particular talk in the context of what Susanna has just uh, discussed. And it seemed more appropriate to, to talk about this. This is not about aesthetics uh, directly, although indirectly it is. Um, but part of the reason why I wanted to speak about aesthetics was because, um, as a psychological scientist, I'm in the position to know that my remit with respect to understanding visual experience comes to a certain point and stops. And as a scientist, I can go no further than that. Okay. Um, and that's, uh, uh, and there is, and I think that actually, I think that you as an audience it, from this particular background already know that. But what I can do is I suppose in that context is just, just provide a commentary from my perspective on why that's the case and show some evidence 
because of course for me evidence is quite important to justify my argument. Uh, and so that is what I would attempt to do. But one other preliminary remark is that um, visual experience, well, we talk about perception, the perception of space, this can be through any of the senses, uh, and proprioception as well. This could be the sixth sense, if you wish. Any of the, the, the five modern senses and proprioception. And um, I'll talk primarily about uh, visual space. Although I think the same principles can equally be held to apply to any of the other five senses in one way or another. And uh, visual space is scientifically the province of the visual sciences, and these are something of a province now of the cognitive neurosciences. And here we have this word science, which pervades through the description of what it is that I'm talking about. And the cognitive neurosciences are concerned with things like, for example, where in the brain is this going on and where in the brain is that going on, and to a lesser extent, although this agenda still holds, um, how in the brain is this going on and how in the brain is that going on. And I'm kind of motivated to set all of these scenes, first of all, because I'll, I'll do a very quick one-slide description of what we know about this in, in the vision sciences, or, or at least the accepted point of view which would probably be the equivalent of two lectures to an undergraduate audience. So you would have to excuse the fact that it's going to be brief and perhaps not very... Well, it's certainly going to be parsimonious. I don't know whether or not it's going to capture all of the information. But, um, uh, well, my perspective is that, this, uh, that uh, this comes to a certain point and then actually what we have in the cognitive neurosciences is very, very great sophistication in terms of what we can measure, and of course science is, is about measurement and observation, primarily, principally, about establishing the truth, um, the truth of phenomena, or the probability with which we can accept phenomena as being the case by virtue of measurement and observation. Um, but there are certain things which of course we can't really measure for various different reasons, and space, by my thesis, is one of these. So. This is the visual brain, part of the visual brain. Um, if you include the eye as being part of the brain, okay, and you have, and I guess I should probably, I don't have a pointer. Do you have a pointer? Okay, I can, I can, I have a pointer. Um, we start then with the eye along the optic nerve to the lateral geniculate nucleus, which is the part of the thalamus, along the optic radiation to primary visual cortex, through, or striate cortex, through the different layers of primary visual cortex, to extra striate visual cortices. Well, it's all part of the same cortex, but there are several uh, discrete processing areas, and then onwards. And what happens is there, uh, well, if you have been, if you're a student of psychology, uh, if you were a student of cognitive science, master's student, or perhaps a PhD student in um, cognitive neuroscience, you would have been following or you would have been reading the literature in the English language from around about 1950. And the literature in the English language, not the German language, I hasten to add, but in the English language, would tell you that we have a construction of visual representation which starts in the eye and increases in sophistication from that point onwards. Uh, now in the eye we have uh, the output of the retina, let's say to be more precise, um, would be uh, contrast signals with no direction, <coughs> with no dimension. Simple light, dark, or, or this versus this, a difference measure. Uh, they would be motion signals with no direction. They would be uh, color signals uh, of which you probably would be unable to tell unless you had some introspection over that process what the colors were. Okay. Um, uh, these would be signaled by cells which map a certain region of visual space as that region of visual space is coded by um, chemical receptors on the retina. So, of course, the, the, the eye moves all of the time, 
the eye moves at a frequency actually of around about 110 hertz, continually moving like this. It's not, our visual experience is not in any respect stable. Well, our visual experience is stable. Um, our neural coding system is not stable. And uh, we are primarily, or oh, this system is primarily uh, designed to code motion. It codes motion and form in two different ways, in actual fact. Um, but at the level of the retina, what it's doing is it's simply mapping each region of visual space. So if you consider your own visual experience at this precise moment in time, you can see around about 210 degrees okay, in, 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 in this kind of dimension. Uh, actually, it might interest you to know that um, your visual scene is meant to be a golden section of horizontal to or rather vertical to horizontal, uh, horizontal to vertical, but nevertheless you have this kind of experience. And the reason why you have this experience is because uh, at each part of the retina you have uh, a cell which is responding to a very small amount of visual space, of retinal space, but I'll use the two terms interchangeably for the sake of convenience. Each of these cells, there are 120 million cells in each retina, um, is coding about two minutes of visual angle and you have the whole visual scene covered by these cells and in fact if you were able to see how that image looks at the point in time when that information is relayed from the retina onwards to the lateral geniculate nucleus it probably would look something like uh, a pointillistic painting a series of independent well, it would look like a pointillistic painting, kind of zoomed right in to some point where actually the structure is meaningless. Because at that particular point, there is nothing other than a faithful series of independent representations of the entire visual scene. Okay, a series of independent representations. That's quite important to, to, uh, uh, to be clear about. Um, now, both motion and colour are coded independently by rod and cone systems. Uh, one system in the retinal periphery is coding motion. This is not the same system as is in the, ret in the fovea which is coding colour. Uh, this is why, for example, when, um, when it gets dark you don't see colour but you can still see motion. Um, and these two systems are independently transmitted to the lateral geniculate nucleus and then onwards to visual cortex. And between visual cortex and lateral geniculate nucleus, or at least from that stage onwards, essentially what we're talking about is uh, an enormously complex parallel uh, dynamic system. However, w and what we know about that dynamic system is perhaps fairly crude and rudimentary, but nevertheless we have some idea on the basis of uh, measurement of that system through intracellular recordings, how that system is working, and that's what I'll go into just now. Um, one other point, uh, cells which are adjacent on the retina project, which, is, which are uh, adjacent, situated relatively to one another on the retina, have the same type of locations in the brain at all levels of processing. So if two cells are together on the retina, they project to two cells which are together in primary visual cortex and onwards. Although the resolution gets lost further up the system, but nevertheless, this type of patterning is, is maintained. Okay. Now this is one reason why at the next stage of processing, in primary visual cortex, you have cells which are responding to actually an aggregate of information from the retina principle of convergence, there are several cells in the retina that which project into a single cell in primary visual cortex and what this means is the receptive field of that cell goes from being very small in the retina to enlarged in the cortex. Okay, And enlarged not in a circular way but enlarged in one or other spatial dimension. And one of the consequences of this is that you have cells such as this cell which is being recorded here it doesn't like motion like this. It doesn't like motion like this. Motion like this, well, that's okay. But if something moves like this, then it starts to fire. And this cell is showing directional selectivity. 
Okay? Now, equally, you have cells in the visual cortex which are not responding primarily to motion. They're responding to orientation, and you would have a cell which would code optimally this light, dark edge, and it wouldn't be interested in this if it were presented in the same region of visual space. And here you have also orientation selectivity, you also have colour selectivity. You have, for example, red-green opponent cells. Okay. So what you see here is, through this pattern of convergence, is a construction of, at least in this case, two-dimensional visual space and primitive motion. Okay. That's what happens in primary visual cortex. At this stage, we're fairly sure that we have no introspection over the outputs or, the, or, or what actually goes on in these brain structures. But from this stage onwards, we have, in principle, some access to the outputs of the, uh, of the processing mechanisms. Now, processing then does one of two things, according to conventional ideas. It travels along what's known as a dorsal pathway. This is the pathway which is taking information originally from the periphery in the retina, coding it through the LGN to visual cortex. This is responding to motion, and it's projecting through mediotemporal cortex into parietal lobes. And this pathway is primarily concerned with things moving. Okay? And this, uh, I I'll deal, detail more how we conceive of parietal lobes uh, in due course, because that's quite important to the nature of representational space. Um, but suffice to say that this is considered to be, it's also known not only as the dorsal pathway, but also the wear pathway. This is how we're able to locate items in visual space. Okay, uh, almost quote unquote, because it's important that, you know, for the point that I'll make subsequently. The second pathway is called the ventral pathway. This is a pathway which is concerned with what is in visual space. Uh, it's also, uh, unlike the dorsal pathway, coding colour. Okay. Um, here, all of the cells here are achromatic. They couldn't care less what colour things are. They're just interested in contrasts, doing something. And whereas you have, um, at this stage, in primary visual cortex, this type of simple motion being coded, Further along the dorsal pathway, you start to have spirals and expansions and so on and so forth. So, uh, actually, the coding becomes more complex. Okay. Uh, if you consider it goes from this to, to this, then you have at least two different types of cell systems which are working at the same time, which are feeding into this cell with a complex motion ca capability. And here, something like the same thing is going on. So, you would have, in visual cortex, cells which respond to this, but not this. And then along the ventral pathway, it goes through further regions of extra striate cortex into the temporal lobes. And in infratemporal cortex, you would have cells which have, there should be an arrow there, but for some reason it didn't, it decided not to come. You have cells which are responding, you have two cells which are described here. Cell, uh, the cell, cell one here obviously likes things which look like lollipops. Okay, it doesn't really like just the stick, and it doesn't like the lollipop itself. It doesn't really like the, the lollipop with only a small stick, or a thick stick. It doesn't mind a square lollipop. It, doesn't, it really likes this kind of morning star. It could be a cell that's selective to the morning star, in fact. It doesn't like the umbrella. Okay. Now, if this, is what happen this is what's happening in the infratemporal cortex of a monkey being exposed to these different types of stimuli. This particular cell, one cell, fires preferentially for this fairly complex assemblage of features. And um, here, of course, you can see the spike rate to this is not the same as to this, or this, or this, or so on. So you have in the second cell also a, a specific pattern of activity which accompanies a stimulus of a particular type of a particular configuration in space. And uh, this has led, this is quite exciting for visual neuroscientists and cognitive neuroscientists because they can say, well, the visual system is constructing representations. And that's how we represent 
uh, our visual experience. That's how we have visual experience, because of this construction from very simple to more complex. And at the end of that process, you even have people reporting, when recording cells here, cells that will fire only to the presentation of Bill Clinton's face, and not to anybody else's face, and not to anything else, but only Bill Clinton's face, and presumably also not to Bill Clinton in his entirety. Um, well, this is where we go with the cognitive neurosciences. And I think that it may be quite clear that actually some of this starts to get a bit in the, into the realms of fantasy. Okay. There is a big problem with the idea of neuronal selectivity at this level of abstraction. Um, it's estimated that in our lives we, we experience about 7 trillion different bits of visual information for which we would need 7 trillion cells in infratemporal cortex. Now we simply don't have that many cells in infratemporal cortex and it's, we would have to have a brain which was enormous. It's physiologically implausible. Okay. Um, if we were hardwired to see everything, we would have problems seeing anything new. In fact, it would be in principle impossible. We couldn't imagine anything new. Um, well, uh, there are a number of different types of objections of this sort to this type of constructivist theory of visual perception. Um, but in this theory of visual perception, space is conceived of in a particular way, which is related to it being a um, matrix-like structure which exists in parietal lobes. And I, I go on to this in the next slide. Okay, this is the first lecture, I have to say, which is, I guess that took about 10 minutes, so if I give this to my undergraduates, they would be extremely relieved, I think. The, uh, here, is the, here are the parietal lobes, or a parietal lobe, um, this has various different functions. It can mediate memory and language, as well as being responsible for kind of interfacing with curricular um, systems for directing eye gaze, directing motion um, in space. Okay, its, it's relationship to, um, to spatial processing is quite clear. Um, a scene such as this, well, from the perspective of somebody who was investigating the function of parietal lobe, what they would say, and, and, and I think here the point of emphasis is, um, I, I, I should kind of stress the point of emphasis because it gives you some idea about where there are problems with the, with the concepts. What they would say is the parietal lobe is in some way indexing all of these regions of interest in this part of visual space. Um, the parietal lobes provides us with, let's say, an analog or an isomorphic system to visual space itself. Visual space is the reference system, and this translates to um, an absolute reference system in parietal cortex. Okay, and then the way parietal cortex would work, and come back to this idea of cells being linked to one another in the retina, they're adjacent if they're mapping adjacent regions of space and then subsequently visual cortex. And the same would be true in these structures as well. You would have things like kind of salient areas of an image like this being tracked by cells which are positioned relative to one another or adjacent to one another in parietal cortex, from which we could conclude that there are some regions of interest. Parietal cortex is also responsible for directing visual attention. This is a heuristic or an organizational process in the brain which allows us to deploy resources, processing resources to this or to that or to something else. And in this case it would move serially. So I mean you would look here and you would look then up there because there's a large amount of activity and the statistics of this being computed by the brain would say well there's something interesting going on there so deploy resources there. Okay. And the idea once again is that what you're doing is you're acting on this absolute reference system. Your processing resource is being deployed around this type of representation. And from that you can identify the position of objects or things in visual space. Okay, this is um, the common understanding of this. 
So this is where this, the theory goes uh, in the psychological sciences from the cognitive neurosciences. And I have to say that this is quite wrong. Okay. But how can I prove that point? Well, there are two lines of evidence which, to my mind, make it quite clear, actually. The first is with reference to... Um, well, both of, them are uh, both of them are with reference to what happens when uh, you have damage to parietal lobes. Um, it's quite common, unfortunately, that people who have a stroke have uh, lesion to parietal cortex, okay? unilateral parietal damage. This will lead to, sometimes, to simultanagnosia, so the inability to, su to see two things at the same time. Usually, actually, when one occupies the visual hemifield ipsilesional, so on the same side as the lesion, and relative to things occupying the contralesional hemifield, uh, there is a much rarer, or mercifully rarer, condition referred to as Barlint syndrome, which was discovered by the Hungarian uh, Dr. Rudolf Barlint in 1909, which comes about as a consequence of bilateral parietal damage. Uh, in bilateral parietal damage, what you have is um, you have profound ataxia, you have very great difficulty moving the eyes. Um, eye movements usually follow attention. So this could be something to do with the engagement of the parietal lobes at, at an attentional level rather than at the level of the muscular level of actually physically moving the eyes. Um, and uh, patients with Barlin syndrome also suffer quite clear simultanagnosia. Okay, they can't see two different things of two different classes, two different classes in the same image. So for example, if you showed uh, this, there was an experiment which was conducted by um, my former boss, Glyn Humphreys, and his wife, Jane Riddick, in 1992 at Birkbeck College, uh, where they had a patient with Barlin's syndrome, and this patient uh, was asked to count the red balls in, on the computer screen. Okay. And very slowly, the patient was able to successfully count the red balls very slowly and with great effort. When given a similar scene, asked to count the red and then asked to count the green balls, okay, the patient is able to count the red balls, but is completely, completely unable to count any green balls. Okay. Can deploy attention, indeed, probably even across the green to other reds without registering the existence of the other class of stimulus. Um, now, what they did then with this experiment was something which was quite ingenious. And the outcome of the experiment was to, was to quite clearly show, actually, that visual space is not an absolute system, but is, it is a system which is defined to a very great extent by what's in it. And what they did is they then combined the two and posed the same question. Now, when these are not competing, when these are not um, somehow compromised, the green this is, somehow compromised by the simultanagnosia, in other words, when there are not two things, but there are now one, then it's possible to count all of the red and all of the green, because both red and green belong to the same object. Okay. Now, what this shows is that visual space is uh, in some way, uh, first of all, perhaps not uh, a uniform matrix which attention can deploy itself across region by region, but it's this, uh, lots of singular individual matrices. The second thing, of course, is that these singular individual matrices are themselves the things in visual space. And so the... Um, one interpretation of this outcome is that we have a visual space which is not an absolute but a relative system of reference. And it's relative because of the things which are in it. Okay. Second example. Second example was from uh, a German artist called Anton Redescheidt who suffered a stroke with unilateral parietal damage. Okay. 
Now, the consequence of this is that he suffered from uh, unilateral neglect. He was unable to, if presented with something in the um, undamaged uh, hemifield, well, in something in the ipsilesional hemifield and the contralesional hemifield, if asked to count the items presented across the whole display, he would, for example, count only those in the ipsilesional field. He was unable to register the existence of anything in the contralesional field. Okay. Now, what he did is he, uh, during the process of remission, it takes about six to nine months, uh, from, the, uh, from the tissue damage, of, because you know, there's some limited regrowth of tissue and there's some limited ret restoration of function, um, depending upon the size of the lesion. He painted self-portraits. And what you can see here from left to right, from top to bottom, are his self-portraits, one after the other, during this period of between six and nine months. And of course in the first one what you see is clear neglect of half of visual space. And then this region of visual space comes back with some degree of abstraction until actually it seems that he's coping reasonably well with the lesion. The lesion is not influencing his, his, his artwork anyway. And presumably from that we can conclude it's not influencing really substantially his perception of visual space either. But of course, and this is a good demonstration of actually how you can recover from this, but it actually says something else which is quite important. Because this is somebody who is painting a picture of themselves. And this is a perfectly rational, intelligent man who knows perfectly well what that picture is at the end of the story and the fact that he does exist in both hemifields. He's perfectly well aware of that. Now the thing is, is that he is compelled, he cannot help but to neglect that region. Well, actually, is it a region? It's not really a region because he paints here and he has the mirror, I assume, here. And he's moving around, he's traversing, traversing an absolute reference system of visual space all of the time. He could, one would think theoretically anyway, completely forget about the fact that, he's, that the mirror is here. You can go to this kind of level of abstraction. What's going on here is he's not, not neglecting a region of visual space, he's neglecting um, actually a half of the object in visual space that he's concentrating on. His visual space, while he's painting this, is himself as a subject. Uh, okay. um, and this is the second line of evidence that what we have is not an absolute reference system, but a reference system which is actually defined probably almost entirely by the content structure of it. So our perceptions of visual space are, as psychologists we would say, they're top-down driven, they're not data driven. They're driven by a variety of different interpretative processes that we apply to the material that we have available to us from our, our senses. Now, I said earlier on that you would find that this would be, not this, but the earlier idea would be in the English language schools of cognitive neuroscience. And this is because actually the problem was solved in the German language in 1912. Of course, 1912 in, uh, now I can't remember the name of the journal, Untersuchen über Lehrer, I think. Um, uh, Max Wertheimer published the Principles of Gestalt Theory. Okay. In the Principles of Gestalt Theory, Wertheimer um, identified a series, uh, well, a taxonomic system of organization of perceptual space, actually organization of thought space, really, it will, it will be his original conception. But this was as applied to visual perceptual space. And you have in his formulation, oops, I beg your pardon, um, Actually, maybe I talk about this first of all. Yeah, sorry. Let me, let me just backtrack a little bit. Um, about our construction of visual space, because I think that I, I kind of forgot what was on the slides, but this is also a fairly important demonstration of this. You know that this is chalk art. Okay, I mean, these, these are, this is three-dimensional as is the other side, but the rest of it is chalk. Okay, it's two dimensions. 
but you cannot help, even though you know this, you cannot help seeing depth. Okay, you have created three dimensions by virtue of your interpretation. Okay, it, uh, that element of this scene is not given to you by the scene. Okay, that's it's completely clear. Uh, you all know that actually, but you know as uh, perceptual scientists, of course, science has to follow natural phenomena. It doesn't lead; it follows. I mean, this is something which scientists often forget. But nevertheless, I mean, that's one illustration of why. The original theory is not complete at the very least. Of course, the original theory shows us what the cells are doing, but perception must be this system that comes afterwards. Uh, there are three different types of um, possible systems that are used in order to provide us with the basis for interpretation. The first doesn't require any representation of any description at all. Uh, all we do is we use cues available in the natural scene, so points of convergence, um, occlusion, uh, the fact that you have a textured background, the texture elements get smaller, this all means that things are further away. At the vanishing point, this indicates that there's a, there is three dimensions in the image. Um, even although you don't see it very well, uh, and you wouldn't see it very well because it's a black and white image, you have atmospheric pressure which gives you a very light um, sky in the bottom of the background relative to blue in the top. All of this means far away, and that the scene is in three dimensions. We don't need to do anything with this, we just need to know how to respond to it. Okay. Um, what are not shown here, well you can see, I mean, it's, these are all the same thing, and that's smaller than that, and so it's likely to be further away. Um, you know, there was a, I know I, I, I know I have less than five minutes left. I have. <laughs> um, I should remind you of the Father Ted story of the cow. You know, this, this, is, this is small and that's far away. I mean, this is, a, you know, this is, we do this. And then you have uh, Gestalt. Well, you know, you group A and B and C and D because they're proximal. Okay, it's natural to do that. You can't help but do that in this case. Um, you don't group a to D or A to F or A to F and G even though you can in principle do this. What you can do in principle actually with a set of infinite um, dots like this is probably pr produce more than infinity number of groupings and our visual systems evolve as a way of reducing complexity to kind of minimal and parsimonious levels of description in order to be able to say, well, I mean, I don't need to do anything other than say, okay, these are a group and these are the group. Not this and this being the group. It doesn't make any sense. Mathematically, of course, it's a set. Perceptually, it's not a group. Okay. So you have these predispositions to interpret the world in certain ways, perceptually, um, which are not of themselves built into the neural hardware not in the constructivist position. And then you have, and I draw examples here from Rudolf Arnheim, because you have something similar. This is what Arnheim in his book describes as the disc at rest. And the reason why the disc is at rest is because the disc occupies the line which allows coherence between the, one of the lines which allows coherence between the apices of the, of the square. So the disc sits on the line and is at rest relative to when the disc sits off the line and is somehow restless. Okay. Um, another example, of course, is the balance of the triangle as it sits with the weight down relative to when it's in a somewhat more precarious relationship with the horizontal meridian. Okay, now, uh, the thing here, what we have are, are violations of these type of principles. At least in this and this case. And these violations lead us to some interesting conclusions because, okay, I mean, it may be stretching a point to say the disc is at rest. Maybe you don't think anything about this. But Arnheim was quite concerned about the disc being restless in the second case. Now, the idea of restlessness, of course, implies a, a kinetic um, from that we can uh, make a whole series of other inferences. 
about the probabilistic nature of the disk. What we start to do is we start to interpret. It obliges a level of interpretation of the structure of the visual scene, which goes beyond any information which is given directly. Because here, at least, I mean, this is easy to demonstrate, because here you don't see these lines, so you don't see the relationship of the disk to the invisible lines, which are structurally part of the structural skeleton of the, of the square. Now, if you start to introduce kinematics, you start to in, in, introduce ideas of implied motion, you can then move on to ideas of even intentionality. And you can certainly build visual displays on a computer with very simple elements like this, where, well, I, in, perhaps I can even demonstrate from Albert Michot in the, th in the 20s. Where there's an employ implied causality. This causes this to move. And you can demonstrate this very, very easily. Of course, on a computer screen, nothing is making anything do anything. But this is what people will report to you. And then you can go further sometimes to this is chasing this and then makes contact with it. Of course, this is not chasing anything. This is not running away from anything. It has no, these are on the computer screen, are small kind of illuminated pixels, one after the other in a row. They don't care what goes on in the world. Okay. But this is the interpretation that you give. And uh, this is another reason why this constructivist perspective on um, visual space is not correct. Actually, what we're doing is we're constructing a visual space all of the time, continually. Now, I suppose to, to finish, I mean, this is a good example of how you have kind of the instabilities which cause, well, I, I guess people like yourselves to construct visual spaces sometimes, what, what you, you put into the visual space. Well, this can be, by Arnheim, this was in some way kind of metricized, so you have an indistinct region in the center here, which is where you can't properly fixate on the, on, uh, and find a central point of balance. Um, and I suppose, uh, now I try to kind of rush through the end, I have to say, but I mean, please kind of contradict me or ask me questions in a minute. But I guess that um, in all cases, what is being provided by us are challenges to our own conceptualization of visual space in this way, by doing this type of thing, uh, and perhaps more appropriately, maybe even by doing this type of thing. And that's the end of my talk. <laughs>